Good evening and thank you for joining us this evening. Fall River Community Media is glad to be hosting tonight's forum featuring the candidates running for Fall River City Council. My name is Keith Tebow, Director of FRC Media and I'll be serving as the moderator for tonight's forum. This is the second of two City Council forums we've held tonight. The first forum ran earlier this evening and can be viewed via replay on Channel 95 and also on our website. All candidates were invited to participate and the makeup of our two panels were determined by draw. The candidates with us for our second panel are in alphabetical order, Gabriel Boomer Amaral, Paulo Amaral, Sean Kadeem, Joseph Camara, Paul Hart, Bob Pearson, Cliff Ponte, Andrew Raposo, and Joseph Salvador. Thank you all for joining us tonight. With us tonight also is a panel of individuals who will be providing the questions for the candidates this evening. They are from left to right, Michael Sylvia of the Full River Reporter, Pamela Martin from FRG TV, and Ray Haig, former city councilor and fill-in host at WSCR Radio. Thank you for joining us tonight. The format of tonight's forum is as follows. The forum will last 90 minutes. There'll be no opening statements, but each candidate will be asked to deliver a 90-second closing statement. Each candidate will answer every question posed by our panelists and will have 90 seconds to do so. There will be no rebuttals. Prior to each question, we'll randomly draw a candidate's name, and that candidate will respond to the question first. After that, we will move to the right and all the way around until every candidate has the opportunity to ask a question. If all candidates are not selected to answer a question first, whoever is left in our jar here will be selected, will draw another name, and that individual will deliver his opening statement first. Let's get started. We're going to start right first off from a question from Ray Haig, and it will be answered first by Joseph Camara. We've heard from a number of candidates who mentioned they want more public safety, lower water, lower sewer bills, and more affordable housing. What are you proposing? How will you pay for it? Camara. Can you repeat the question, please? Sure. We've heard from a number of candidates who have mentioned they want more public safety, lower water and sewer bills, and more affordable housing. What are you proposing, and how will you pay for it? Well, we've increased public safety. Um, we support the budget added pay raise for public safety officials. Also, uh, affordable housing. Um, you know, the, the problem with the housing market the, is the lack of housing, period. If you can build more housing, and the government should stand behind incentives so that we can afford to build more housing, not just in Fall River, but throughout the Commonwealth, then the prices will come down and make it more affordable. But the shortage of housing is what's causing the problem. If you have 200 people fighting to bid on housing, 25 houses, the price is going to go up. So you have to build more housing, and it'll lower the prices. Um, Fall River has done a, a, a phenomenal job. 30% of our we're at the 30% mark as far as affordable housing goes. Many communities outside of Fall River are not even near that threshold. They don't even come up to 5%, many of them. So we have to make sure that they provide affordable housing so that Fall River is not looked at the only place where people can come to for affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, Ray. Thank you, Pam and Mike, for being here, and my colleagues on the panel. Um, it's a good question, Ray. I think. Um, I, I agree with President Kamara about the affordable housing part. The public safety, the police, they did get an increase uh, in their, uh, with their contract. Uh, now the fire department are waiting for their contract. Um, but I do think public safety is very, very important. And I think in this city, uh, we need to do a little bit more. Um, I'm not saying that we're not doing a lot, but we just need to do a little bit more. And I think more of uh, what I look at with public safety is transparency. And I think that when I was on the city council, and I believe you might have been the chairman of the public safety committee, we went throughout the city, at, uh, throughout the neighborhoods, and uh, went to different neighborhood uh, communities throughout the entire city, had our meetings, and the people there were able to go to the, to the meetings, express their concerns, whether it was crime, uh, potholes, uh, a dilapidated building. It was really good, and, and it, we got a lot done there. So I do think that. As far as the funding part for the public safety, we're doing a good job. I think, uh, hopefully, the fire department will get their fair share, but I do think transparency for public safety throughout the city um, and those meetings will help a lot. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. Uh, thank you, the whole panel and everybody here. However, public housing, 
I think we almost have enough, to be honest with you. And as Council President Kamara had said, let's get the other cities and towns, especially the ones that surround us, to do their fair part, and they're not doing it. However, we do have land available. Just look at Rodman Street, where we tore down a housing project. That land is still vacant. There's vacant land on Dwelly Street, right next to some of the houses that our State Representative Sylvia has worked so hard at and getting rid of a mill building there, and there's houses being built there. So I, I don't see it as a big problem. It's one you need to continually work at. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ponte. Thank you. I'm going to be completely candid. There's not one person sitting on the stage running for office here locally that is going to be able to solve the problems when it comes to market rate housing. But what we can all do here as elected officials, those who are seeking the office of city council, is recognize your role. Recognize the role that the subcommittees on the floor of a city council need to do a better job of being more proactive in doing their work. Public safety, the public safety committee needs to meet more. It's not just the ordinance committee and the council as, as a whole that meets. In addition to that, I think the city council also needs to utilize their role, which is a checks and balances when it comes to the municipal budget. Everybody wants and they're going to advocate for public safety, they're going to advocate for transparency, but the reality is this current Fall River City Council passed a municipal budget and didn't even discuss revenues. They had no appetite to discuss revenues with the exception of three councillors, Councillors Kadim, Councillors Dion, and Councillor Raposo, who all voted no against the budget because we didn't discuss revenues. That's an integral part of any role of a four of a city councilor. You have the ability to reduce, reject, or approve, and that didn't happen. So I think if the city council recognized its role and recognized its purview and, do their, does their, and, and performs the duties they were elected to do, I think more will get done to answer your question as a whole. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Raposo. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for us for all being here. Um, to echo what Mr. Ponte had said, I was one of the three councils that voted against the municipal budget. Uh, we did not speak to revenues. And one of the biggest things is we looked at a budget. We had vacant positions that we continued to fund and was one of the sticking points for me. Um, that money could be better utilized in better ways to help our citizens. Again, you know, we are talking about more public safety, which we did already. We gave um, police and EMS their contracts. And again, I hope the fire department is squared away shortly. But again, if we can better budget, better utilize what is available there, <coughs> cut out some of that wasteful spending in the sense of vacant positions, reallocate that money to other places. Because again, one of the biggest things I talk about often is beautifying our city, making sure it's clean. That $2 million that's left over in vacant positions can be reallocated to departments to make sure we have a city that's safe, that's clean, and a, a, a place that we can all be proud of being a part of. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity. As you all know, I was number 18. I mean, 19, I was out. I just haven't uh, hey, come back in. But like this gentleman was talking about, yes, you know, uh, taxes, you know, uh, the budgets and all, these are all in incumbents talking about this, and we're still here talking about it. We just got to get more action going, doing. I'm sorry, that's all I got. Thank you. Mr. Boomer Amaral. Can you, can you read the question again, please? Thank you. We've heard from a number of candidates who mentioned they want more public safety, lower water and sewer bills, and more affordable housing. What are you proposing, and how will you pay for it? Okay. Well, we have almost a half a billion dollar budget. And though I agree with uh, Mr. Ponte and Mr. Raposo on, on, the market, on the market, the housing, as well as the budget and public safety, 100% agree with everything that they said on that. However, when you start looking into this budget, there's plenty of money to be found. We need to stop. We need to stop with the admin, all, all, these, all these top tier jobs getting these, these bonuses and these increases and increases and increases, the guys on the ground getting nothing. We need to focus on that because our water and sewer bills are going up, all our bills are going up, mostly because of those salaries. It's not because of the work. It's not because of the cost. The costs have not been doing that. It's not COVID anymore. We're not dealing with that stuff anymore. The bottom line is it's, it's fiscal responsibility. And right now we're being run by an admin and we have unfortunately counselors that just fall in line and don't look at the budget, don't even look at that. And that's a big problem. The money's there. We don't need to come out and take more taxes and raise taxes to do it. The money's there. We need to use it more effectively and more efficiently. Thank you. Paulo Amaral. Good evening, and thank you for um, allowing me to be here. 
And I agree with what Boomer is saying here. It exactly comes down to fiscal responsibility. And if you listen to all the incumbents here, none of them have proposed here how they're going to be paying for additional housing and for safety. They run around the subject talking about other things, but how are we going to pay for it? And one of the ways we're going to pay for it is by making sure that we have independent orders, audits. How are we going to save? How are we going to look at the budget and make cuts in order to get those savings that we can use uh, for our community, that, that we can use for safety? When are we going to go ahead and tell these age dip developers that if you come to this community, we don't want the 10%, we don't want the 20% affordable housing, we want 30%. And how are we going to pay for it? We're going to look at the budget, and we're going to see where there's the pork, and we're going to cut it. And all the incumbents here walked around the question, and none of them are willing to commit to cutting from the budget and to living with our means and being fiscally responsible. And that's what we need to do. Thank you. Mr. Kadeem. Thank you. There's, there's still one incumbent left to speak, so uh, I'll say this. Uh, the reason everybody's walking around the, the, uh, the topic of conversation is because we don't have the, the jurisdiction to propose anything in the budget. We're a legislative body. Everybody on this panel, everybody on this committee, uh, everybody running for public office needs to understand what their local government is. The town, the city charter is very, very clear. The executive branch is the what puts forth the budget. We make an appropriation. As Councilor, uh, former Councilor uh, Ponte mentioned, we can only reject, approve, or reduce. We cannot increase, and we cannot make any type of formal request from the administration. We can work with the administration trying to uh, get items that we want to talk about, but if t in terms of affordable housing, I think everybody has mentioned a, a good part about affordable housing. I thought Mayor Coogan had a, a great response during the uh, last debate that we need a third, a third, a third. He was spot on. You want to talk about public safety? There's a larger crisis going on with public safety. We've got more money that's being thrown at public safety. There's not enough individuals who want to currently work in public safety. That goes with police, mm -hmm. fire, EMS, communications. There's a reason behind that. I think we need to work with the administration and figure out what's going on with that. And we can go back in and start talking about the budget because I'd love to hear what other candidates start talking about plans and what they would do and cut fat. I think when you start looking at other communities, we're not competitive with other communities because we don't pay the proper salaries that other communities are paying. And I think it's important to have the right people in the right positions. Thank you. Pan Martin will have our next question and it will be addressed first to Gabriel Amaral. Okay, campaigning is certainly different now than it was years ago. I see fewer signs, and I've only had one candidate come to my door to speak in person. That was from school committee. Haven't received any flyers. Uh, what can I expect from you in the next three weeks coming up for the campaign? Um, I, I don't even know where, what part of the city you live in, but um, I know I've been out there. I've been at the shops. I've been at the stores. Um, I'm online. I'm doing interviews. So I'm out there personally doing it. I'm not having a team go out there. You don't see anybody out there dropping off signs for me like the other guys. You're not going to see that. Uh, I bring my own signs. I come to your door. I'm, I'm the person. I'm the candidate. I'm the person that wants to answer your questions and, and hear your concerns. So when I go out, that's, that's what I'm doing personally and firsthand. Um, for the next three weeks, I do have um, some targeted areas that I think have been neglected by the city long enough, neglected by the same people long enough. As far as the other, the other people putting out signs and flyers and doing that, it, it's, it, they see it. They know it's the same voters. They know they're shoo-ins, and that's, that's the problem, is they're not concerned anymore. They don't feel they have to answer to the voters anymore because, ah, well, I got my set voters. I'm okay. I'm good, and that's the problem. So if we can't get out there and reach the new voters and the people that are registered to vote and just don't show up to vote, we're going to have a problem, and you're going to have the same problems you've been getting for years, same promises. Same debt, it's all going to keep coming your way. So my goal is to reach those new voters and educate people and, and get out there and hopefully get some new voters in with new ideas and start listening and start paying attention because it's their futures that it's affecting. Thank you. Paulo Amaral. Going back to what uh, Sean Kadeem said here, um, they can reject the, the budget and they can also find cuts on the budget. Matter of fact, we have people sitting up here that couldn't even um, do any of that and by default the, pa the budget passed. So there is things we could do. As far as the campaigning, uh, Boomer is absolutely right. You look around, I personally go and I deliver my signs, I put them, I call, I call people, I meet and greet. And you're right, the incumbents here, I see people sitting up here that don't even have one sign. And I go out there, I try to reach people on social media. Uh, I have a couple of ads running. It's very hard for us as newcomers to break into the good old boys club, if you will, because they know they're a shoe in. They know they don't have to put the signs. There's people up here that don't put any signs, know they're going to probably get reelected, and they're going to continue the same downward spiral that the city is going into. In the next couple of years, we're going to run out of one-time money. 
come, Je come uh, December 2024, what are we going to do then? They're not gonna, we're going to continue in the same situation that we are now in two years from now. And it's going to get worse because the economy is going to tank. And when it does, we're going to be even worse off than we are today. Thank you. Mr. Kadeem. Thank you. Uh, to Mr. Amaral's statement, I did mention that we can approve, reduce, reject. I, I said that. So. Can you clarify which Amaral, please, because this is going to get really confusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. You can just point to me. <laughs> okay. So the, the question was about the campaigning moving forward. Um, I'm going to continue to do what I've been doing, and I think that's been leading by example, working. Um, and I don't, I don't disagree with the incumbents that are coming in. It is hard to break in um, when you're running uh, for election. But politics is different. It's not the same. It's not what it used to be. Uh, the grassroots campaign doesn't exist anymore. And quite frankly, the voters are so disinterested and disenfranchised. So a lot of times, you know, going door to door, it becomes more of an inconvenience, and you tend to lose some support. Uh, with regards to that because folks actually um, value their time and their alone time with their their family and don't want to be uh, interrupted. So you've got to find new and creative ways to get out there and I think part of it is talking about the real issues, uh, continue to, you know, <coughs> having the uh, flexibility to go out there and, and do the job that you've been elected to do. So for the incumbents, we have the, uh, the fortunate ability to actually you know, show that through the council meetings and other forms uh, of meetings that we have. I think it's much more difficult for the, the, uh, the new candidates that are running. Mr. Kamara. Thank you. Well, I, I remember when I was a new candidate, um, and I can say this, as many years I have on the council and anyone else here, no one's a shoe in I lost an election four years ago. It wasn't a shoe in then. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what the voters are thinking or what they want to do or what they're going to do. Signs don't vote. And I put signs up because I don't want to take it for granted. I want to put my name out there. Some people say to me, hey, Joe, put a sign in my house, put a sign in my house. You only have so many signs, so you put as many up as you can, and it takes time, and campaigning now is a lot different than it was when I first started. But it's not just about campaigning when it comes to election year. It's about being involved in your community. When I first ran for city council, I coached baseball, I coached soccer, I had children who were playing, I was involved in my community. I was, I'm, I'm a man of faith. I go to my parish every Saturday, Sunday, depending on what we have going on. You have to be involved in your community on a regular basis. There's not an organization in this community that I have not been a part of at one time or another. Growing up as a child, lifelong resident of Fall River, I went to Duffy High School. Paul and I played basketball together. Uh, I was president of the Spanish club. I mean, there's so many things that you do throughout being in the community growing up that people recognize you, remember you from your involvement. I had so many parents and say to me, I remember when you coached my children. I have children today that are a lot older saying, Mr. Kamara, remember when you coached me in baseball, in soccer, in basketball, and it's just being involved in your community. And if you're involved in your community and you want to make this community a better place, as I was, I was newly married, had a child, just recently had a house, bought a house. Thank you. You got to get involved. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question, Pam. And uh, just so, just to start things off, I don't take anything for granted. I work my butt off every, camp, every two years. People know that. People see it. I go door to door. When I, when, I, we first got, when I first got elected, Joe and I and four others, six new people got elected um, as city council. So it's not difficult, sorry, right? It's not difficult, um, to, but it's hard, hard work. Ray got in two, two years later, so yeah, exactly. One year later. But, but um, my point is that you don't take anything for granted and you just work, 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 and work every day. Uh, and that's what I do, and I know that's what a lot of my colleagues on this uh, uh, panel are doing right now. And I will continue to do that up until Election Day. Um, I'm very uh, happy with the way the campaign is going. Um, and I'm going to continue to do that. And again, I put up my signs myself. And I, my campaign manager and treasurer is Aaron Harrington. It's us two. Uh, so I don't have a big group of people helping me. Um, but things are going very well. And I'm going to continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. Pam, I believe your question was how have campaigns changed over the years? Well, they really haven't changed all that much. It's still hard work. Hard work is what gets you elected. Hard work is what keeps you there. However, if you take it for granted that people are going to vote for you, I believe this November 7th you're in for a rude awakening. I've met many people in my quest, and I talk to them in the supermarkets and restaurants, and they constantly tell me, we need change. Well, I don't believe the primary showed that because the primary was a poor showing of the voters. However hoping that it doesn't snow November 7th. I hope more people come out to vote, because you have to. If you really want change, folks, you need to do your job. It's your 
right and your honor to vote. As far as how hard I'm working, anybody that meets me knows I work very hard at this. I put up my own signs, as many of the candidates have stated. And I'll tell you, right now, the average cost of a sign is $18, the ones that stick in the lawn. That's not cheap by any means. So yes, you have to have fundraisers, and I've done that. A minimum amount of money, and that's the way I go. I'm not going to spend all of this money that a lot of contractors and other people are giving out. With that being said, I yield to the next person. Thank you, Mr. Ponte. Thank you. Um, so I, I can relate to how the grassroots campaigning is a little different. You know, when I when I ran for higher office and wasn't successful at it two years ago, I remember vividly walking down Wood Street. It took me four hours, probably because I was walking really slow and probably because I tried to hit as many doors as I possibly could. So when I, I, I went all the way down to the bottom of Norman Wood, that whole part off of Stafford Road, and I've, I, in three and a half, four hours, I talked to four people. And, there, it, and, it, and it was a lot of work and, and, and it, was, it was frustrating. Now, everybody was happy to see me and we had great conversations. But the effort to see people face to face is different today. I think we have to recognize the fact that social media has really taken off. I mean, new people, you, people used to get a newspaper on their doorstep anymore. They don't do that anymore. Social media is dominating the lives that we live in from so, all social media aspects. But I'm going to tell you that for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to continue to do what I've done. I'm going to continue to listen to the residents of this city, continue to hear what their concerns are, which will make me a better city councilor if I'm fortunate enough to get reelected back to the city council. It's listening more and talking less. I find that to be very effective when governing, and that's something that I would, I'm going to continue to do with the people that I speak to over the next several weeks. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Mr. Raposo. Thanks, Pam, for the question. You, know, you talk about uh, over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about what I've done over the first two years of me on the council. One thing I've prided myself in being on the council is being present around the city, and I always feel that the best way to get in hold of citizens and voters are when you go to city events and you make yourself present. Um, I've gone through city events. I've had an opportunity to talk to many voters about their concerns. And again, those are the same concerns that I bring back to the council, both in our full meetings and our subcommittee meetings. Um, to Councilor Kadeem's point, subcommittees are very important, and I, I pride myself in doing my homework and making sure that I'm present for, the, for those meetings, as well as understanding the true um, issues that we're facing. And again, you don't really get feedback unless you see people and you talk to people. So to, to Mr. Ponte's point, yes, social media is a big point, and that's where you do communicate with a lot of people. But I do still value the face-to-face -face conversations. And I think that's why being present out in the community as much as humanly possible is very important. So this way you can get the feedback, you can understand what the issues that they're facing, and then as an elected official, act on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Well, uh, signs, I put up a lot of signs. And I also take, took them all down the following day. And then somebody backed out, and I went back out, put them all back up again. And I had no help. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a lot different today. You know, social media, hey, I'm an old guy. I'm not very good with that, but I managed to get on Facebook here and there, you know, YouTube maybe, you know. But my thing is, I'm out all, all weekend, every weekend I'm out. I'm at St. James, I'm at Tequila, I'm at Tipsy, I'm at Candy Eat. Uh, this, this is where I meet my people, all right? And I know what they want. They talk to me, Joe, what are we gonna do? I go, what are you gonna do about house? What are you gonna do with, listen. I mean, until I can get in, there's nothing I can really, you know, do. I mean, it's, you know, just work, work, the street, work, the, work the crowd, you know, work the people, go out and say hi, you know, talk to people, tell them what you're all about, you know. That's it. That's all I got. Sorry. Thank you. Michael Sylvia from Fall River Reporter has our next question and will be answered first by Sean Kadeem. One of the primary duties of the City Council is to fund city services. Is more funding the solution for the homeless crisis in Fall River, or is it part of the problem simply attracting more people to these services? If you believe more funding is a solution, what problems would you fund? If you are against more funding, what are legislative ways to prevent um, homelessness problems in a positive way? <clears throat> it's a great question. I, th I, th I think more funding is needed for the homeless uh, problem. I actually. I uh, went to the ICMA, was in, in Austin this year, and one of the um, most spoke about topics was homeless, homelessness and how to deal with it. And it's not unique to the city of Fall River, it's not unique to, to Massachusetts. 
Uh, but when you consider that the state is spending $45 million a month on um, housing, temporary housing, uh, it's a significant problem that we have here. Um, one of the things that I would like to see uh, in having the opportunity to talk to administrators from um, Vancouver, Washington, uh, they have a very similar approach to the city of Fall River. The one thing that they do differently, which I think would be beneficial to the city of Fall River, um, is transitional housing, what they call transitional <coughs> housing, which is temporary shelter. Um, and the reason I think this is going to be benef uh, beneficial, and I think maybe if we have a million dollars, we identify a, a location in the city where we get, um, you know, 20 to 30 or 40 of these temporary shelters that can be up and put up in 20 minutes, and we have that has heating, electric, uh, beds. Uh, locked doors, windows uh, for these uh, home, the people in these homeless encampments, and what we'll what we'll be what we'll be able to do is improve the quality of life, remove these folks from uh, these encampments, and place them in these in this specific housing uh, housing situation, and then we can direct our services into that particular area. Um, so this way, with the, without having the encampments, we can't. Re I mean, without having shelter, Thank you. we can't remove these individuals Thank from you. these encampments legally. Thank you, Mr. Camara. Yeah, it's a very difficult situation. It's a very tough thing to address. More funding would help, um, but I think the solution would be try to get treatment to the people that need treatment, try to get assistance to the people that need assistance. Um, many people are homeless for different reasons. Some, no, no fault other than they lost a job, they fall upon hard times, someone in their family passes away, their income gets cut in half or, or it's at zero, they can't afford their bills, and some of them become homeless in the streets. Those are the people that you have to help out to get temporary housing so that you can get them back on their feet, find them another job if they lost their job, try to see what you can do, help them with benefits if they lost their spouse. Um, and then other ones have other issues, other issues that are, you know you need to try to get them treatment for. So it's a, it's a very tricky situation. Um, I don't know if setting up more encampments is the answer, or not more encampments, but setting, finding another place for them to go is the answer. Um, it's something that if anyone had the answer, they'd give it to now because this is happening all over the country. It's, it's um, just an amazing phenomena where people are just, for one reason or another, find themselves at wit's end and how to make ends meet, and they're in the situation. Some of them could probably get out of the situation if they realized they had a problem that needs to be addressed. Other them, others, just it's hard times and things just not, the cards are not falling in place for them. They want to get help, they just don't know who to turn to and where to go. And I think the city should assist them in that, in that avenue and more funding will help assist those avenues. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you for the question, Mike. I, I uh, um, am in favor of what Joe just said and what Sean just said. And I think this, this housing crisis, um, homeless crisis isn't going away. It's going to stay here. Um, I do hope that, you know, if we get that, those particular funds that Sean was talking about, those transitional housings, housing going up, I think that's a good idea. I don't know if it'll work, but I'm willing to try anything. I also think that uh, I believe the, the governor uh, has had a press conference and, and telling that we're running out of room for the migrants in the, in the Commonwealth. So I think, you know, where, where's, where, where's our priorities? I mean, I think everybody needs, those migrants need assistance too. But the people that live in our city need the assistance as well. And I don't know, you know, who, who do we go, who do we help out first? And I think we have to help out the people that live in, that were living in Fall River, born in Fall River, that are unfortunately in a bad, uh, bad spot right now. We help them out. Um, I'm all for helping everybody out, but I think we've got to have a set of priorities. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. Mike, thank you for the question. I remind everybody here that in the Bible <clears> it clearly says, by the grace of God go we. Well, that simply means any one of us, anybody listening or watching, it could be you tomorrow. And I certainly hope it's not. But we cannot take care of the world's problem in Fall River. We need to take care of Fall River's problem. If we're finding people coming here from Rentham, Attleboro, wherever, go back there. It's simple. You're here collecting because we have money. We're gonna pour more money into that problem. You know, we've got enough of problems in our city where money could be used for police and fire and, and road repairs and sidewalks. However, uh, Ray Mitchell once said on his TV, sh on his radio show, he talked to a homeless person and he said off the cuff, how much money do you make collecting money on the streets? And the gentleman confessed 40000 a year. You know, there's something wrong with this problem, folks. We can't keep doing this. But I thank you for the question. Thank you. Mr. Ponte. Thank you. I think we need to recognize where our strengths are, 
right? I, I think we need to recognize that we have an individual when it comes to homelessness that goes to the encamps, the camps, and, and, and she speaks to them and finds out that there's problems and tries to get them help. Let's recognize that we have different nonprofit organizations that are in the city who do a phenomenal job of going above and beyond to try to help these people who need help. But everybody sitting here is talking about funding. We'll give more funding. Of course, I'll support more funding. But how are we going to do it? As a city councilor, let's recognize what we can advocate for to the mayor. We can advocate for the mayor to possibly hire another individual to help the current individuals that are hired within the police department to help with the homelessness problem. We can advocate for that, whether that's an assistant <coughs> health and human service employee that will be able to do it. We should also look and see on a funding mechanism what Mayor Wu of Boston has done when it comes to Cities Together plan where they've adopted plans like that that will create and supervise programs to support people who are homeless, people who fall for substance abuse problems. That's the unique challenges that we have as a city. But I also want to recognize if you haven't been anywhere else in the country, if you haven't been to Seattle or Portland, our homeless problem is not as bad as it is in other places. But I think we could do our job. We can continue to support our local agencies. And as a counselor, we can advocate to the mayor so hopefully they can have more support and staff to help these people who need help. Thank you. Mr. Raposo. Thank you. I think it's important that we remember the human element in the situation. And that's one thing that I, when I look at this, it's important not to paint with a very broad brush. I think the situations with our homeless encampments and our homeless individuals in the city all suffer from different issues. May it be just a string of bad luck, it would be mental health issues, may it be drug and alcohol abuse, it's a variety of things. And I think it's important to note that there are a lot of work, a lot of work being done on the ground right now supporting these individuals to get them the help they need. Um, I think as a council and, and through the subcommittee that I chair, we've had these conversations and I've advocated to the administration to add additional support, a mental health clinician, for example, to that street outreach team to help those individuals who need this guidance, who can point out services. Um, it's important that, again, we advocate on behalf of all these nonprofits and these people on the ground doing the work. We're just a piece of the puzzle. Um, to say that anyone has the exact solution, we do not. But we can advocate to move it forward, help every individual. And I know it's not going to be changed overnight. But every person we help is one positive impact moving forward for our city. We need to continue doing that. We need to keep moving forward. We need to keep supporting. We need to keep the conversation going and continue to support these individuals who are currently suffering. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Well, this is a tough, situa a tough subject because this is national. It's internet. I mean, it's the U.S. has got a problem all over. What can we do? Throw money at the situation every time? Maybe that's not the answer. Families got to get together. I mean, all these people got families. Why don't they reach out to their family? Whatever they did in the past, hey, some forgiveness. You know, the drug addiction. We all have a problem. We all have our demons. So it's not easy. No one has the answer. All we can do is try try to comfort them, try to, you know, house as many as we can. That what do you call what type of what, what type of heights? That vacant land. Hey, put an encampment in there. It's, it'll be temporary, but give them something, you know, give them somewhere to go. And they you know, they they're centralized. You can have safety, you can have uh, the fire uh, apparatus there, you can have uh, police officers, you're close to a market, you know, and the, you know, the community can come together. Thank you. Gabriel Amaral. Can you, can you read that question again? I know there was more than just homelessness involved in this. Sorry. So one of the primary duties of the city council is to fund city services. Is more funding the solution for the homeless crisis in Fall River, or is it part of the problem simply attracting more people to these services? If you believe more funding is the solution, what programs would you find? If you're against more funding, what legislative ways could you um, impact the homelessness problem in a positive way? Okay, thank you. So I don't believe we need to throw more money at the problem. I believe throwing more money and creating all of these you know, programs and nonprofits after nonprofits, everybody's coming in, everybody's got a plan. We have more drug and alcohol rehab centers on every corner in the city, and know what that's bringing? More people from out of the city that are just filling beds, and when those beds don't work because they're out in a week or two weeks or a day, guess where they're staying? They're staying here. We can take, 
I know somebody mentioned that there's like a $2 million fund and vacant jobs. Let's create a couple of jobs. Investigate in those places, making sure that these people are getting the actual help that they need, and then putting these people back where they either came from, give them an option on where they can go, where they're not in the environment. Because this, the environment here with the drugs, the prostitution, the gangs, the violence, it's not a good place to stay sober, right? They're not going to stay sober here. It's too easy. It's walk out, of any, walk out of any of these sober homes on Pleasant Street. What are you walking into? The dealer outside? You need to reallocate the money we have, and we need to start working on the actual problems, not just throwing money at it. Stop giving money to friends and family. Stop throwing money at Viva Fall River for you know, false parades. Let's focus on the problems that we have and help our citizens, but also help these people that are in trouble, that need help. Do I agree with the housing that uh, Mr. Kadeem said? I don't know that I want to give people more safe places to, to shoot up and you know, do things. But I can understand where he's coming from with that. You know, again, you have that human element. You want to take care of people. I'm all for it. I was homeless in the city as a kid. I grew up. Thank you. Thank you. Paulo Amaral. Mike, you know what's an easy, an easy answer to give? It's to going back that this is a national problem. We all know it's a national problem. How can we as a city empower these individuals to do better? That's a better question to ask. And the way we can do this is basically we already have the CDA fast team outreach out there. We need to document them. We need to figure out what their needs are. We do need to spend some money on mental, mental health. That's a big thing. Obviously, as we spend money and we increase homelessness services, we're going to get people from out of town to come here. So there's a double-edged sword there. But we need to allocate money at least to mental health. Another thing we can do is we have $30 million of ARPA money left. How about we put some vans together, some uh, buses, and we have mobile showers. Give them a shower. Give them self-worth. Let them, let them get up in the morning, feel good about themselves. Maybe look for a job. Be self-dependent uh, depend on, on themselves and, and be free from the homelessness a problem that they they have. I mean, there's so many things we could do. This is a hot topic for me because we keep saying it's a national problem. Everybody has it. I don't care if everybody has it. I care about the city. I care about empowering them. What can we do? With $30 million, let's put together a few vans with some showers. Give them some dignity. Let them go out there and be self-sufficient. Thank you. Ray Haig is back up with our next question. And it will be directed to Paulo Amaral. Keeping the city charter in mind, please explain your understanding of the role of city councilor. The role of city council is basically, to me, helping the community. It's a legislative branch, gets passed down to um, you know, the ex executive branch, tries to make decisions, it gets passed down to us, and we either implement them or reject them. But I think bigger than the charter is looking at the needs of the community and approving what makes sense. How can we help the community? That's the biggest thing for me, okay? Um, take the Army, for example. I mean, this city council that we have here now, I, I don't understand it. Are they going to help the community or not? And how do you do that? What's the best use of uh, our resources? As we all know, there's more and more population coming to Fall River. There's about 2,500 units in Fall River right now. If you average that out by a family of three, that's 7,000 people. That's going to put us over 100,000 in this city. And we have to allocate our resources in a way that it's going to work for every individual that comes here. Nobody talks about that. It's the same thing with the Army. It gets kicked down the road. I know we're going to have it on the agenda again, but come on. Listen, there's a guy that wants to, get, to, to give that life new building, to save the facade, to bring taxes to the city, and what do we do? We do nothing. Let's, the resources, the limited resources that we have now, let's ex expand those and let's make those work for everybody. That's what I care about. Mr. Kadeem. <clears throat> Thank you. So we're, as I mentioned before, we're a legislative body, so our, our largest function is the appropriation of funds. Um, it's ordinances. It's the approving of appointments that uh, per the town, uh, the city charter that uh, the mayor sends down. It's disposal of, of property. Those are the main functions of uh, the city council. To think that there's more to that, there really isn't. We can only make suggestions. We can only work with the administration. We cannot dictate what is coming down. Uh, we are a legislative <coughs> body. That is it. And all the issues that we were facing, if the legislative body had control, then every other town and every other voter in other towns that have town meeting would be dealing with these issues. When you see <coughs> town meeting in other communities and small towns, they do not address any of these issues because they're a legislative body. They only focus on appropriations and what are sent down to them. That is all that they do. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. So a great question. Um, Ray, it's a great question. And I know when we were on the council together, we always had a saying, the mayor 
proposes and the council disposes. And that's what we do. We get the budget in and we dispose of it. We approve it, we reduce it, or we've rejected it. And I've done all three. I've reduced the budget certain times when I saw it need to be reduced. I've rejected the budget, I voted against the budget when I saw it need to be voted against, and I've approved the budgets. They need to be approved. But the fundamental thing that a council can do is provide basic city services to our residents. Advocate for the department heads what their needs are so they can provide the services that they're paid to do. Give them adequate manpower to get the job done and the materials to help those people do the job. You can't turn your back on the department heads when they're telling you this is what we need to do to make the city better because they have the people on the ground, on the streets every single day doing the job. So you have to advocate for the department heads when you're crafting the budget. Also, you have to advocate for the residents. And you have to do this without breaking the bank. Residents have a lot of needs, a lot of things that we see that need to get fixed. They also have quite a few have quite a bit of experience in certain things and you get some great ideas from our residents. So you have to be a counselor. You have to listen to what they're saying and I do that great. I like to listen to what everybody tells me and then you craft it and try to advocate for those needs. You have to do it from everyone because as a counselor when you're involved in the community you hear it night and day what the needs are and what you need to do for them. Thank you. Wish I had more time. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thanks for the question, Ray. I, I couldn't have said any better than what uh, Joe did. We, the, the mayor proposes we dispose. Um, I do think, though, that I do think it's very important on the subcommittee parts of the city council in different committees, like I, I mentioned before, the public safety committee, um, going out into the neighborhoods, also going to the neighborhood groups, um, and getting out into the, into the city to find out what issues are important to the residents. And they're all different. In, in, in the Flint, there's a different issue there. In the North End, there's different issues. South End, different issues. Um, and I think getting out to all the, throughout the city is very important, very key. And you bring it back to the city council, bring it back to the mayor. And also, too, while you're out there, you might want to bring some department heads with you, especially in those meetings. And I, I, I really think they, that they, they work uh, when you're out there in the neighborhood with the neighbors, whether it's public safety or any other committee, um, it, it does work, and I think it makes the government work better. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. First of all, the ch city charter, in my opinion, is a joke because it's not doing what it was meant to do. It was originally meant to define the roles of certain <coughs> departments, how many people can be on a board, which we're not abiding by anyways. So that's why I think it's a joke. However, we have a city council sitting on the city charter, and some of the questions that have been asked have not been answered. We have a disabled individual who ha has to almost break his neck to be heard, and that's not fair to him. However, as far as some of the people on this panel tonight, they haven't addressed the question that was asked, what would you do about the city charter? I would scrap it if I had the choice. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ponte. Thank you. I think as a city councilor, we need to be an advocate for the people, be the voice of the people, and recognize the role of a four of a city councilor. You're, on the, you're the legislative branch of government. Not one city councilor can do anything by themselves. I learned that very early on when I first got elected. If I can't count to five, I'm not being able to accomplish whatever my initiative is, my resolution is, or what my idea is. But one of the biggest roles and responsibilities of a four of a city councilor, and this enrages me, continues to enrage me, is the municipal budget. And I'm going to repeat it again. The role of a city councilor is to review and vet the budget for department heads, through department heads and through the mayor's office. And this current city council, again, passed a budget and did not have a discussion about revenues. It's irresponsible. I'm being completely candid and direct with you. Councilors literally sat there, not all of them, some of them voted on a budget and didn't discuss the important part of the budget. It's irresponsible and if I'm fortunate enough to get elected to the City Council, I will object to moving forward having any of these meetings without, if we're not going to discuss revenue. It's an embarrassment, it's irresponsible, and you didn't do your job. It is the biggest responsibility, the municipal budget, and it was a complete failure of most of the councilors on the current City Council to not do their job and vet this budget properly. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo. It's important to understand our roles as, as a legislative body in the city. And like others have said, I mean, we not only advocate for the people, hear their concerns, and we bring it back to the council to do, do the actions that are within our power. Um, we, are, we don't have unlimited power. 
in many ways, we craft the ordinances, we appropriate funds. As Mr. Ponte said, we speak about and vote on the municipal budget. Um, those are our biggest pieces. I think for me, again, being present in the community and hearing from those individuals is so important. It's about more listening and less talking. And that's why, you know, often enough, I, I'll go to meetings. I don't say a lot, to be honest. I, I take in a lot of what's being said. And then when something that needs to be spoken to is, that's when I jump on the opportunity. Um, I think sometimes we kind of talk in circles about, about issues and really never come up with anything with substance. So it's important, again, we focus on our role, knowing our role truly, and using the authority that we have to the best help our citizens and move our city forward. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Seeing here, I'm, this is my first time doing this. I'm absorbing all this information from all these counselors, former, you know, and it blows my mind. Like the, the charter, you know, it should be black and white. There should be no interpretation. People interpret the charter the way, if, the way it benefits them. Well, no, the charter should benefit everyone in the city. You know, city council, everybody. Yeah, the council role is a legislative branch, yes. The mayor sends down things that he wants to pass, we approve yes or no. And that's simple as that. Thank you. Gabriel Amaral. Of course, we're a legislative branch. Of course, Mr. Ganeem is correct. Mr. Ponte, I, I agree 110% on. Um, even Joe talking, you know, when they're talking about Mr. Hart talking about subcommittees. Yes, that's our job. Reject, you know, whatever way, what, what, however we want to do it, that's fine. But we still have to represent the people. We still have to listen to the people. Those subcommittees are more important than people think. You know, we don't have public safety meetings. Here we are, one of the most dangerous cities in Massachusetts. Yeah, that, that, that directly correlates. It really does. So at the end of the day, we have a more important job than worrying about just the budget. And, you know, we can talk to the mayor. We can talk some sense into, well, some of them. We can try to talk sense to them. But we can show the people and educate the people on why they should vote better and what, how they should write their letters, how they should come to council meetings, because we can educate them on how to you know, work around certain problems so the budget doesn't come out us that way, or things aren't sent down from the administration to just, nope, you're gonna do this. These rubber stamp yes answers and yes votes need to stop. So we can do more than just reject, you know, reduce, or you know, whatever. We, we can do more than that. So I do believe subcommittees are important there. Thank you. Pam Martin has our next question, and it would be directed to Andrew Raposo. Okay. The FBI is tracking increased threats against Jewish and Muslim Americans in the wake of the October 7th Hamas attack. It's no surprise that war could inspire violence here against our Jewish and Muslim families. Do you feel that Fall River first responders are prepared for potential violence against our peaceful Jewish and Muslim residents? It's, it's a good question, but it's a hard question to answer, and I think that's something that we, we should definitely look into with the chief. Do the, does the police department and our public safety officials have the resources available to address this? And it may just be simply education. And as an educator myself, I think the biggest thing that we need to focus on is how do you defeat hate is education, teaching our kids that that's wrong. I mean, I'm a person of faith. I teach at a Catholic school, and it's one of the first lessons we always teach. Love your neighbor as yourself. And if we can't do that and we can't spread that message, we're going to have issues. We're going to have violence. We're going to have hate. We're going to have all these different issues that we face. It starts with our kids, and that's why I pride myself every day when I talk to my students and I talk to youth in the city, how important it is to show love and show respect to one another. Hey, listen, we all may agree, we all may disagree, but the important part is, is that we can show respect and love to one another and then we can begin to break that hate cycle that we find. I think one of the one important things and one of the groups that I thoroughly enjoy in the city is the Four River Youth Prevention Group that promotes exactly this. They promote love and peace and unity and working together and a thing like that is so important for our kids because that will build for generations to come. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Uh, that's a great question. I've been listening to hearing about this all week on the radio and I don't discriminate against any race, any religion, no matter what. We all have the right to be on this earth. We have a right to be brotherly, you know, and uh, we, uh, 
You just have to learn to get along. I don't. I never taught my kids to hate anybody. I never. I. He's talking about Cal. You know, I was a CCD teacher. All right. Hard to believe, but it's true. <clears throat> and I would actually have my kids, 12 kids in that class, would wait for me outside. Their parents were going to church, and the parents would say, "What are you doing?" Well, I'm with my teacher, and my or my whole class was sitting next to me, while the other classes they were all scattered all over with their parents. But yeah, you teach them, you know to love each other, love one another. It all starts in the family. It all starts in, within the four doors, within your doors, you know, within your house. So, and when you go out, you know, you put that out there, that vibe, that love for family and love for people, you know? We all get along, we all one family. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Amaral. Simple answer, no, I don't think we're equipped to handle terrorist attacks in the city of Florida. I do not. We can't handle the gang units that we're tracking now. You know, our gang unit is working day in and day out. We're closing down prostitution and human trafficking rings. We're, we're tracking, what, 5,000, I think the number was, that came out a week ago or so, gang members in the city alone. And we can't even stop the violence that we have now from a bunch of kids shooting up everything except themselves. You know, I don't think we're equipped to do so. We're understaffed. We've already discussed it. We, we know they're understaffed. We got. 10 cars covering 12 sectors. We got one person, you know, one officer is going to wait to even respond to domestics. We can't even respond to a domestic violence and keep our own citizens safe. We're going to worry about terrorist attacks. We, we, we can't. We are not equipped to do so. So as great as our police officers are, our police department is awesome. Our detectives, I put against anybody in the world. I know some great police officers, some great detectives. They're not Superman. They cannot do it staffed the way they are. They cannot do it the way we are run in this city. And they can't do it with their hands tied behind their back, which 99% of the time seems to be the problem. We couldn't even stop kids on dirt bikes. We couldn't even get them to do that. So, no, I don't think we can handle terrorist attacks. Thank you. Follow on. Look, the whole Jewish and Hamas thing goes back thousands of years. <coughs> and more recently, it goes back to Resolution 181, which is in the 1940s when we gave that piece of land to uh, uh, Jerusalem. And as far as the question to this, to this uh, uh, in our community. I think we're okay here. We have a diverse community. We're a melting pot. I don't think there's going to be any issue between a Jewish and uh, Palestinian hate or anything like that. And we're very fortunate that we're a very accepting community. But I will say this to Boomer's uh, point here. We are not equipped to, ha to handle what we have here as far as the gangs, as far as the drug dealings. I believe that we need to do what New York has done, create substations in the Flint, substations in areas of Fall River that have high crime area. And that, you're going to solve not only if there happens to be a Jewish and Palestinian incident, you're not only going to solve that, but you're going to be able to solve what's currently happened in this city, which is the lack of uh, prosecution, the lack of resources towards crime. I want my kids to be able to go to my driveway, pick up a basketball, and play without fearing for their lives, without having a stray bullet come into my house. That's what I want to do. And in order to do that, we need to fund the police. We need to create substations. We need to get the community involved. That's what I care about. Thank you. Mr. Um, I do think the police department is equipped to, to handle a situation similar to that. Do I think the police department is understaffed? Absolutely. Uh, but they have proven with the protests uh, last year and the year before that they are equipped to handle that. They came back to the city council. The city council funded additional resources. Um, Chief Governor has done a phenomenal job making sure that we have a, a great emergency management plan that we can execute, that we have the additional training in service for, for police officers. Um, and I, I think this carries over to the fire department and EMS as well. Um, the more important piece of this whole thing is the partnership that they have built with other agencies. You know, the uh, district attorney, the state, uh, the state police, the DEA, ATF, um, and more importantly, local communities, other policing communities uh, for mutual aid in case something is to occur that if the staffing levels are not there, that we will have um, the mutual aid that we need or SEMLEC coming in, the regional uh, police um, group coming in to help and assist uh, with a situation like that. So absolutely, I think they are equipped. Do they need additional uh, staffing? Yes, uh, again, it's not unique to the city of Fall River. There is a shortage. shortage. People do not want to become police officers anymore. Do, they do not want to become firefighters anymore. They do not want to become paramedics. It is a difficult <coughs> challenge that we have to uh, address. And just throwing money, we've thrown money 
and we still can't attract individuals to come and want to work in public safety. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. Thank you. Um, I agree with my colleague. Um, I think they are equipped. Not saying that you're going to prevent everything from happening. Who knows? Are we talking about Oklahoma City bombing? Uh, what kind of terrorist threats or attacks are we talking about here? Are we talking about someone's going to walk into a synagogue with an uh, AK-47 and expect the police to be there, but when the guy's walking at the same time? You don't know what these people think. You don't know what they want to do. You don't know where they're coming from. And, and I don't know how you can prevent it 100% of the time. So it's a very difficult thing. It's a very sad state right now. Um, I can remember in, in Vegas, people were at a, a concert in Vegas and a guy in a hotel room shooting at him in a crowd. How do you prevent that? How do you say it's the police department's fault, it's, it's this person's fault? How do you say, you know, whose fault it is? You just try to do the best you can. Um, the, the country, the world is in a scary place right now. What's happening in, in overseas is going to get escalate and it's going to get worse before it gets any better. And some of that might trickle down. I, we saw, I heard an instance where someone was stabbed because they were Muslim and they were stabbed, a six-year-old boy was stabbed because is a Muslim belief. I mean, if you can't have freedom of religion and you can't have that, what else could you have? It, it's just, it's a sad state right now, um, but I think we've got one of the finest police departments in, in the country, and I think they do a phenomenal job, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be 100% safe at any point, no matter where you go. You don't know what these people are thinking and what harm might come your way. Thank you. It's unfortunate. Mr. Hart. Thanks for the question, Pam. And I think, too, I agree with the panel, what the, the, my colleagues have said. Um, and I do think, too, that if, there, if there's going to be that, some kind of issue like that, um, that's going to be a very heightened security level, I do think that um, the chief, the mayor, they're going to get informed by the Boston, the FBI, and um, governors uh, and the other state departments that handle that particular um, high level of uh, security. So I, I'm confident uh, in, our, in our police department and our chief um, that he will gather all the, prop, the proper departments together and, um, you know, put a, put a stop to something that, that you're discussing in your question. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. Recently, in the last year and a half, I've attended almost every neighborhood meeting that I can possibly attend. <clears throat> last night, I was at another one, and the police chief was with us, and he expressed to us that the numbers that are giving out sometimes by the media are not always accurate. And he showed us by graphs and various other uh, tools. However, I believe he thinks he is fully capable of quelling anything that may arise. Can we call on the state police? Yes, we can. They're right here in Dartmouth. It's a 10-minute ride. The state police just graduated another 120-some people. So I think the, our local police department, not only are they doing a great job, they can be adequately supported by local towns and the state police. This chief is probably one of the best chiefs we've had in years. And I think the people in the Fall River need to let him know that every time they see him, because there's nothing better than good morale. In talking to the chief, I expressed my concerns about foot patrols. We need those. You don't know a police officer till you meet him. And how do you meet him? Let him walk in your neighborhood. Go out, take him a coffee. He'll, he'll refuse it. However, we need to be more centrally idealistic about what's going on in the world, and I think we're prepared for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. Ponte. Thank you. I, I think this comes down to a matter of being able to plan and execute, right? As long as the, our floor of a police department has the ability to do that and make sure that there's open dialogue between mutual aid with, when it comes to Somerset, Swansea, Westport, our state police, the sheriff's office, uh, different uh, departments that are able to come in and help where needed if something crazy were to happen. I think we also need to recognize that, you know, when I was last in office, the city of Fall River Police Department was seeing over 32 thousand calls a year. In 2021, 32,000 calls came into our police department. In 2020, 31,000 calls. In 2019, 32,000 calls came into dispatch. And, and I don't think that our police department would be able to handle it alone. So it would come down to ensuring and hopefully advocating as a city councilor for the police chief and the mayor to work with other cities and towns, making sure that they have a plan and being able to execute. But um, recognizing the issue and recognizing that it is a, it's a larger issue and it's not something Fall River would be able to do alone, relying on mutual aid, having a plan for proper execution and planning would be important. And that's something that uh, if I'm fortunate enough to get elected for, I'll be advocating for for all departments, not just public safety, not just education, but every single department. Thank you. Michael Sylvia has our next question, and it will be answered 
first by Joseph Salvador. Incumbents, what have you done in your role as a council the past two years that you're most proud of? Non-incumbents, if elected, what is your top priority? Mr. Salvador. Well, my top priority will be safety. <coughs> safety, yes. Our streets are disastrous. Our sidewalks are disastrous. Our vendors like uh, Liberty, they put in the trench and they decide they only pave from curb nine feet to the, to, the, to the trench, past the trench, which leaves another seam in the road, which weakens our road. So I don't know who makes that decision. You know, and uh, education, yeah. Education's a big one. Because, I mean, we have so many kids, we have children that drop out of school because they're falling behind on some of their schoolwork and all. But you know, some, some, sometimes they're good at something else, whether with their hands. Put them in, bring them to Diamond. If they're, good, if they're not doing well in high school in Durfee, bring them to Diamond. Put them there for about a month. See what they can do with their hands. And if they, they're doing well, keep them there. Because that kid one day will own a plumbing company, will be a, an electrician, a mechanic. It, you know, you can, you know, not everybody's capable of being, you know, in front of a book all day. Some, some people just have to use their hands, you know? And that's it. Thank you. Gabriel Amaral. First and foremost, public safety. Um, it's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, I raise six children in the city. I have, you know, between four different schools within the city. I, I agree education is important. I agree the school system is important, but I'm not running for school committee at the moment. So I can only do so much, but I can educate my kids and I can do the things that I do. I coach baseball, I coach football, I coach sports all day long. I, I edu educate kids every day. I put kids into the military. I get them out of the city. I put them into college. So I do, I do what I can to help out with that stuff. Um, but at the end of the day, if we don't have a safe place for these kids to thrive, they're not going to thrive. They're going to fall right into the same redundancy, the same gangs, the same crime, the same way of look, looking at life. So um, I'd have to say public safety has got to come first, fiscal responsibility, and then working with our youth all kind of mesh together as far as a top priority for me. Thank you. Paulo Amaral. Do you mind repeating the question, please? So for incumbents, what have you done in your role as a council the past two years that you are most proud of? For non-incumbents, if elected, what is your top priority? Man, this is a, a good question. And I'm self-financing my campaign because there's so many things that I see that we can improve in this city. And I'm just going to read some of these in random order. Crime, crime housing, uh, resource allocation, like I said. Are we preparing ourselves when one-time money is no longer available? The answer is no. Savings. What are we doing to save? What are we doing? We have unfilled positions that are in the budget. Why? I don't understand it. Savings in the budget, looking for savings is one of the big things that we have to do. Another one, political choice. Look at all these incumbents today. We worked together. We did this. We did that. For 30 years, 35 years, you guys have been doing this. And we're still at the point where we are. So political choice is a big thing for me. Anybody listening out there, if you want more of this, continue voting for them. If you want choice, vote for the new people coming in here. Resource allocation. Again, we're a growing city. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for resource allocation? Kids are going to go to schools. We spend $10 million on transportation. <clears throat> More kids are going to go to school. The city side is going to have to pick up that bill. What are we going to do to, to, to raise that money for, for transportation? I mean, these are all the things. Housing, another thing. I mean, I don't see anybody raising their hand and saying, you come here, you get tax incentives. You're going to with the man that we, you give us 30% affordable housing. Again, resource allocation, crime, housing, political choice, savings, fiscal responsibility. I could go on and on and on and on. Thank you. Mr. Kadeen. First of all, we have an ordinance for HDIP for housing. Um, so I won't go into that. And I'm not running for mayor, so I can't solve all the issues because I'm not the executive branch. But what I have done over the last two years, um, and that goes to my term, uh, is become an asset to my colleagues and to the mayor working with them. I, I have a unique skill set that I don't think any other uh, candidate or incumbent has. I served on the school committee. I've been the city administrator. Um, I'm now on the city council. I serve as a town administrator. I have a very unique understanding of municipal, municipal government um, that I use to help uh, educate you know, my colleagues and assist with them and then also work with the, with the mayor uh, in trying to get things uh, done cooperatively. Thank you. Mr. Camara. Thank you. Well, one of the things I'm most proud of is <clears throat> supporting Diamond High School. 
I think that that's a, a very important to this community. It's a, it's a big part of what I've done throughout my tenure on the council. When we started way back then, when, Councilor, when former Councilor Haig was on the committee with Paul Hart, we started building new schools. We hadn't built a school. We built Henry Lord in the late 80, early 80s, late 70s, and then we stopped building schools. 90% reimbursement on a dollar. We put a program in place, began with Mayor uh, Lambert at the time. We built 13 <coughs> schools, uh, middle schools, elementary schools, Durfee High School, and now Diamond High School. So throughout my career, throughout my tenure, as some say, you know, what have they done in 30 years? Well, I've only been there for 26, going on 28. We're building new schools. I was part of taking land by eminent domain, the old criminal site, putting Meditech there. It was a big vote in the council, something I was proud of as well, to look at the building now compared to what was there. Creating two industrial parks. We had Commerce Park, that filled out the capacity, providing many of people the opportunity to go to work there, thousands of people go, and now we did a land swap and we've created the bio park, which again led the way to Amazon and other things. Helping along the way, Water main replacements, we're still doing it today. It's my first resolution that I put in place when Councilor Hagen and Councilor Hart initially got elected with me back in 1996, and we still do it now. Every single year, we line our water mains where people will turn on their faucets and get black, muddy water that's no longer the case throughout our city. So I'm very proud of the fact of Thank improving you. our infrastructure and all the things that our schools. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm not an incumbent, but I am on the school committee right now, presently. And I think just from, uh, from one issue on the school committee that I'm very proud of, and I worked with my colleagues with it uh, on, that, on this issue, and the superintendent, is increasing the pre-K. Um, that's been a major accomplishment for our district, and I think it's only going to get better. Uh, we've increased the pre-K seats by, by, by easily over 100 seats, and it's on its way to becoming universal. So that's, um, for, for the school committee, as a school uh, committee member, that's, I'm, I'm very proud of that. As far as the city council goes, there's no question I've already, it's been my platform since I uh, started campaigning, it's in its public safety, and I'll do all I can um, if I'm fortunate enough to get on the school, uh, on the city council again, I'll be, at, I'll ask to get on the public safety committee meeting, and I will work with, uh, tirelessly on that committee, going out into the neighborhoods, talking to the neighborhood groups, and listening to them. Thank you. Mr. Pearson. I believe the question was, as a challenger, what would you do? As the incumbents have already stated what they have done. And not all of them can live up to a high reputation. However, my hot type, top priority would be our water problems, our sewer problem, <clears throat> and the rainwater runoff fee. My rainwater runoff fee is more than my water bill. And I understand that this fee, in some years, will raise almost $7 million. That's going to be very hard to do away with. Just think of it. If somebody's giving you a gallon of milk a week, you may not need it, but you're going to keep it. And that's what this administration and the council is going to do. And I understand that. However, if elected over the years, I would like to see the rainwater runoff fee reduced. We're not going to get away with it right away, but we need to look at that day. This is supposed to be a five-year plan created by Mr. Sullivan and Mayor Correa, Bob Correa. However, Bob Correa was turned out of office two years later because of it. That and the fact that he wanted to reduce every department head salary by 10%, which is not a bad idea. But when we give the head of our water department 150000 he's not worth that kind of money, folks. Not saving us any money. It's going to cost us more. When all this opera funding goes away, we're in deep trouble. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ponte. So I've had the opportunity and fortunate uh, to be elected to the city council and serve six years. And I was able to advocate for the people, such as advocating to make sure when the prior administration goes, tried to get rid of um, trash trucks for about $1,000. We were able to get over a million dollars where I was able to advocate as a member of the city council for that. I was able to advocate for our veteran center to make sure that we use community development money because we didn't know how we were going to pay for windows and a roof that was leaking. As a city councilor, I was able to advocate and get support from my colleagues to make that happen. Uh, I was able to advocate in the south end to make sure they're they can demolish the King Philip Mill facility. I was an advocate for that. I'm happy to see that down. I was uh, an advocate to propose that our fire stations were able to get uh, uh, repaired and maintained. I was able to be fortunate enough to see that through. 
I was able to advocate for 100 percent of net school spending as a former city councilor. I'm happy to see that has continued. And every time I was on the city council, the, we made sure that the administration was able to commit to education at 100 percent of net school spending. I was fortunate enough to go up with colleagues of mine to Boston to advocate for transportation when it came to education, when, because the transportation costs is a huge impact on our municipal budget, and it is non-net school spending eligible. And above all else, I was the first city councilor who was ever, ever made a motion to reduce a municipal budget because that started happening with the new charter under the Jaisal Carrera administration. And I was happy that I was able to get support to reduce items that needed to get reduced. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Raposo. I'm proud of some of the things I've been a part of the past two years in the city council. I just want to mention a few. I think one of the key things here is partnerships with my colleagues. And I've been fortunate enough to work with some of my colleagues in the council to make some of these things happen. First and foremost, one of the things that I've been advocating for is supporting arts and culture, which I believe has a direct connection to tourism and economic development in our city. And I've been very much in part of that, part of my subcommittee as well. Um, using Bristol County ARPA money, one of the biggest things I've always complained about is the city is not always clean. We have graffiti issues across the city. I worked with my colleagues in the ordinance committee to strengthen the ordinance on that, as well as advocate for the purchase of graffiti removal machines. And those have been being used across the city to reduce the amount of graffiti that we have. And lastly, one of the programs that I partnered with Council Dion on recently, and it's still in motion, is supporting our veterans, especially in this coming time when heating bills will go up, they may, they may need some basic necessities like food. Um, we're advocating for some Bristol County ARPA funding to support them. And right now that is in process, so individuals, the veterans community can apply for it, and we can give them that, that support. But I think it's key to highlight that no one city council does this alone. And partnerships and collaboration across the aisle, doesn't matter if you agree or disagree with them all the time, partnerships are key to make this happen. And like others have said, it's important that we can count to five and make sure that some of these initiatives that we want to put forward, we do together. It's less about the I and more about the we, what we do as a council together to advocate for the citizens of our city. Thank you. Thank you. I was hoping to try to get one more question in, but I don't think we're going to have time. If we do, it would be very short answers, and I want to, don't want to do that to our candidates. So we're going to get to our closing statements. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to do so. There have been three candidates who have not answered a question first, so one of those three will be first for our closing statement. And providing the first closing statement will be Cliff Ponty. Well, thank you so much. I want to take this opportunity to thank uh, WSAR, Four River Government uh, TV, Keith, BCC, Four River Government Television, and Fall River Reporter for being here today. I want, to, I want to also thank the residents of the city of Fall River who have given me the opportunity in prior election cycles when I ran for city council to be your voice, be your advocate, and be your city councilor. Recognizing my role as a city councilor, I think, is a big important aspect. And I've been able to document, which I was able to just do through the last question, how I've been able to advocate for you as a taxpayer, as a business owner. I am a real estate broker who owns multiple businesses in the city. I know what it's like to make payroll. I know what it's like to uh, operate a budget. And I have been an advocate uh, for uh, ensuring that the residents of this city have proper representation. You're going to hear fancy words from everybody all the time. Transparency. I support public safety. We need to start advocating as counselors being able to recognize where our weaknesses are and make them strengths. For many years, government has been so reactive. We are not proactive in government at all. Not at a local level, not at a federal level, not at all. Fall River needs to start working to do that and have a plan to address the problems that will face our community. And if I am fortunate enough to get elected on November 7th, I promise you and your family will receive nothing but my very best. <coughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Raposo. Thank you to Forward Community Media, WSAR, Forward Reporter, and FRG TV, to my fellow candidates here on Bristol Community College for having us. Um, I want to thank the citizens first and foremost for your support in the preliminary election. I've been blessed to be in this journey with all of you, and I humbly ask for your continued support on November 7th. Um, I've had the privilege to work with you, the constituents of our city, to make it a better place to live and work. And speaking to many of you at different events in the city, it is clear that the citizens of Fall River seek to continue to improve the city that we all love, and my hope is I'll be granted the opportunity to continue to do this. Let's work together to expand the arts and culture of our city, keeping our city clean, <clears throat> and ensuring the safety of our citizens through continued support and public safety. Constituent services have been one of the most important parts of my role as a city councilor. When a citizen reaches out, I worked hard to get the answers and assistance that they need. 
It's the individuals on the ground that we work together with are the heartbeat of our city. And working with them in collaboration with city officials allows us to make forward progress. If I am blessed to be reelected to the floor of a city council, I will continue to work with you to move our city forward, to continue to serve with honesty and integrity. I work hard for you, and I will be honored to continue to serve on the council. I humbly ask for your vote on November 7th. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Salvador. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, all of us here on stage want, want, want the same thing. Safety, education, and entertainment. <clears throat> you know? And uh, you know, entertainment brings the community together. But now, now it's your, your people at home is your, 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 your ch chance to choose nine out of the 18 candidates that you can trust with the future, with your future, your family. Thank you. Thank you. Gabriel Amaral. Uh, no prepared statement. Uh, at the end of the day, you're gonna, you, you've heard it. Uh, I, I've done this, I've done that. We can't do this, we can't do that. Uh, we hear a lot of what we can't do instead of focusing on the things we can do. Yes, there's some things that have been done. You know, we look at, oh, well, you know, the people don't want to do this. Well, the civil service has about 1,400 people on it, so people do want to be cops and firefighters. I was on that list. I've been on that list before. In 2020, I was on that list. So people want to do these things. We're, we're picking specific people. That's the problem. Um, another big problem is, you know, again, I advocate for schools, too. Like I said, I got six children. I, they're in four different schools in the city. Do I want the new Diamond? Sure. Did I want the new Derby? Sure. With reason. But buildings don't educate kids. We still need to focus on the issues. We still need to focus on the problems. We're not focusing on that. We're just focusing on which donor is going to get the job so they can get the money. And that's all these same people have done for year after year after year. Um, promise here, promise there. They're going to promise you everything right now. What have they done? <coughs> here we are, half a, almost half a billion dollars later in the budget. Still one of the highest crime rates, still one of the lowest education levels. We're not fixing the problems. We're creating more of them, and we're just throwing one-time money at it. And it's going to get worse if we don't fix it now. So. A vote for me, and I'm going to fight against that. Thank you. Paul Amaral. First of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I did have a prepared statement, so I'll read that. I understand the current state of our city, where it's headed, and how crucial it is to be on financial solid ground in the next few years. A vote for me is a vote for you, the property owner, the renter, our senior citizens, and those on limited income. I will make sure that our current residents matter and you are included in our city's future. I will demand more affordable housing from age dip developers, helping those on limited income find affordable housing. I will make decisions based on facts, not emotions. I will think logical on matters that impact our city and vote with the best interest uh, of our residents. I pledge to vote no on future water and sewer increases in order to alleviate some of the burden on property owners and help stabilize rents. I will support independent municipal audits that will uh, find savings by cutting waste. Uh, these savings will allow us to hire more fire and police personnel and, keep, and help keep our city safe and in a good financial ground. Unlike most candidates, I'm not affiliated or loyal to any <coughs> individual or group. I answer to no one in local government. Uh, my only obligation is to please you, the citizen of Fall River, not the career politicians that have been running our city to the ground for the last 30 years. Remember, voting for the same individuals yields the same results. Don't be fooled by the same promises and political BS that's been recycled countless times. Simply put, garbage in, garbage out. Together we can make Fall River better, and I hope to have your support come November 7th. Thank you. Mr. Kadeem. Thank you. I'll keep it short. I won't use my 90 seconds. I want to thank the panel um, and to all the uh, candidates that are running and put their name on the ballots. Thank you. I know it's, not, I know it's not an easy thing to, uh, to run and take time away from and sacrifice time from your family. With that, to the, uh, to the voters of Fall River, I want to thank you. Uh, you've given me the opportunity since 2006 to serve you in some capacity. Uh, and my only, my only purpose for running was to make the city of Fall River better. Um, and that's what I will continue to do. And I want to thank you for that opportunity. And hopefully I have uh, your vote and support. And I ask for your vote and support on November 7th. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kamara. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things I need to clarify. Um, you know, I hear one of the former councilors saying that he was the first person to reduce the budget. I think that's a statement that I heard. I can remember Councilor Haig reducing the budget when we served together. I can remember Tom Kozak reducing the budget, Steve Walter reducing the budget. I reduced the budget. With city, Sean Kadim sitting to my right, Councilor now is city administrator. We reduced his budget. 
So I don't know where that came from, but I've seen a lot of city councilors, myself included, reduce the budgets and make cuts to the budgets and send it back to the mayor for further reductions. So, but I guess, you know, you can say whatever you want. And as far as the budget goes this year, the way we passed the budget, as the council president, when you're standing there and your colleagues make a motion to take the vote to pass the budget and you have to take the vote to pass the budget, some people vote yes, some people vote no, you either pass it or don't pass it. But the individual that's complaining about that was the council <coughs> president when the council took no action. I wasn't there, I wasn't part of that. But they took no action and the budget passed by default. At least we took action and took a vote. I don't know about taking no action, but as a council president, you have to do what your colleagues motion to do and you go from there. You just run the meetings. As far as being a counselor, I take an awful lot of pride in being a counselor. I take an awful lot, it's a hard work. I take it very seriously. Um, it, it affects a lot of different people. And I want to thank the residents for giving me the opportunity to serve them and serve the residents throughout my tenure. Um, it's a job I take very seriously and put a lot of time into it, a lot of effort into it, and I try to do the best I can. I've built new schools, I've created job opportunities, I've done an awful lot. Thank you. My tenure and November 7th. Thank you. Hopefully after your continued support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hart. Thank you, Keith, and thank you, FRG TV, uh, Fall River Reporter, FRC Media, and WSAR. I'm running for uh, city council because I bring 14 years of experience between the city council and the school committee. And I understand the challenges facing our city, and I also see the opportunities. I'm a lifelong resident and Durfee graduate, and I'm raising two boys here as well. It is my desire to create a city that they'll want to stay in and raise their families here as well. My vision for Fall River is simple, a safer city, a city where everyone can afford to live and where businesses thrive. On November 7th, please vote Paul Hart for city council. Thank you, God bless. Thank you, and Mr. Pearson. A year and a half ago, I sat down with my wife and we made the decision that it was time for some change on the city council. While I agree with a lot of our city councilors, they've tried to do a good job. However, when I talk to the voters, the everyday people, they tell me it's time for change. When someone tells you they've been around for more than 20 years, folks, it's time to give it up. Council Pereira has said every two years, I'm, I'm not gonna run after these two. Council Kilby has said the same thing. The reason I'm running is because Leo Pelletier is not running. I want to fulfill his seat. And while Leo was a do's, does, and don'ts kind of guy, I think we can all relate to what Leo was all about, the average, everyday person. And that's Bob Pearson. Not Pearson, but Pearson. Leo advised me many times in the last six months uh, on a Sunday breakfast. But Leo has decided to give it up for health reasons, and I admire him for knowing his time. With that being said, November 7th is a very important date. Everybody here is going to ask for your vote. However, if you want real change, Bob Pearson is your answer. Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the candidates and our panelists for being here tonight. Special thanks to our FRC media staff working behind the scenes, Steve Rice, Michelle Dumas, Lucy Cabral, and Denise Pumaguaye. I would also like to uh, thank our media colleagues at Fall River Reporter, FRGTV and WSAR for simulcasting our coverage over the past couple of weeks and sharing our uh, forums with as many people as possible across Fall River. You can watch a replay of this forum and all the other forums we've produced over the past two weeks and hear from statements from the candidates by tuning in to FRC Media Channel 95 as well as our special Election 2023 webpage, frmedia.org slash election2023. Please vote on November 7th. At that night, we'll be partnering again with FRGTV for complete coverage of the election results. We hope you can join us, and thank you for watching tonight, and have a good night.